morning, everybody. It is good to have you here. I've got to tell you, when we were thinking about this memorial, I was wondering even this morning in 19 degree weather who would show up, but there are some people that really love this couple, obviously. And I am so glad that you are here. I'm so glad that you chose to be here. Let's pray together. I welcome you. I welcome you to the church if you're new here, and I welcome you to our congregation's blessing congregation. You call it your own, okay, because it's everybody's, that's for sure. Let's pray. Father, give us wisdom as we memorialize our friends. Al and Holly were much more than just attenders here. They, O oh precious Lord, gave their heart and soul for the cause of Jesus Christ around the world. And Father... When there was no real defined benevolent program, they were the benevolence program. They worked hard in this church in many ways, and we want to glorify you for them. Right there, Lord, I know you have this capability. You talk to billions all the time. They're in glory here on earth. You make the world run. So I know you have the capability of just leaning over to Al and Holly right now and saying, hey, that service down there is getting started. And just let them know, dear Lord God, that our goal here is to honor you, to lift you up, because that's what Al and Holly's goal would have been. So we just pray, Lord, that Christ would be exalted this morning, that your word would go forth faithfully. And that you'd be honored in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I appreciate you being here. Brother Keith's going to come right now. We're going to sing, When We All Get to Heaven. That's one of their favorites. Stand together, if you will, with me. When we all get to heaven. All right, I don't believe Brother Keith's mic is on, and uh, we're going to need that for the, uh, for the recording, of course. Uh, is it on now? Okay, why don't you test that real quick? Test, test, okay, test. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. On the third, let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be old. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Us, we'll sing and shout the victory. 
I'm going to have Brother Keith introduce Evelyn because I believe he knows her better. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Go ahead, brother. So uh, this is Evelyn Kelflish, and she has been a lifelong friend to Alan Holly. Um, I've had the pleasure, which uh, Earl's had the pleasure of talking with her on the phone and texting, and, and last night we spent a good time uh, just just loving on Alan Holly and sharing stories, and uh, uh, what a blessing she's been to me. So, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evelyn. Testing. Yes, here we go. Sorry. I'm used to singing in church. I'm not used to speaking in oh. church. <laughs> um, but I just want to say there are really no words to describe how much I miss Alan Holly already, but yet how wonderful it is to know that we will be together again in heaven one day. Amen. I've known Al since I was six years old. I lived next door to him and attended the same church as he did. I met Holly when I was a teenager, and they were, had begun dating in Holly's own words, taken from actually the words that she spoke at my own mom's memorial service. And my mom is in those pictures that you've seen. Um, when you see the high five, one of the two women, my mom's on the right, Holly's mom, Hilda, is on the left. Um, but she, she had said, because Evelyn and I are so close, it goes without saying that her family and mine are as close as can be too. Holly and Al, along with Holly's mom, Hilda, and my family all attended Franklin Avenue Baptist Church on Long Island. Holly and Al's love for the Lord, love of music, and desire to serve the Lord allowed us to serve together for many years at that church, singing in the choir together, and often Holly playing either the piano or the organ to accompany me as a soloist on Sundays. Our antics and pranks before and after rehearsals were often legendary and got us into a lot of trouble. Their love for the Lord was such a beautiful, vibrant part of their lives, and they never failed to show it. They also were both a joy to spend time with for so many other reasons. Mm. Al had a great sense of humor. He loved the Three Stooges, if you didn't know that already, <laughs> and, their, and their antics of those Stooges. And he tried many a time to put one over on either me or my family. He was lovingly given the name by us of Wise Guy, and would laugh every time one of us used that phrase to describe him. Al loved to cook, he loved to grill, he loved to just surprise us with unique foods. He loved bluegrass music, he loved to play the banjo and harmonica, he loved to go to bluegrass concerts in Nashville. Holly loved Al immeasurably, and therefore tolerated <laughs> his bluegrass music, his banjo, and his need to attend these types of concerts and places. It was wonderful to know that he had great friends both on Long Island and here in Delaware that would travel with him and enjoy those things that Holly did not enjoy. It truly made him happy. Al never forgot a kindness done for him, mm. nor did he ever fail to acknowledge it. He was proud to have served in the Marine Corps, and he was proud of the honest, hardworking man that he was as a roofer. He also loved Holly's mom, Hilda, as his own and took wonderful care of her over the years. Al and Holly never had children of their own, but Holly always said, if asked, that Al and her students that she taught as an English teacher at Cedarhurst High School on Long Island, they all were her children. Mm. She did not need any more than them. Mm. Holly was and is the sister of my heart. That is how we would always describe ourselves to others. Her mom and mine were best friends, and we became the bestest friends, as the saying nowadays goes. We had so much in common. Our love for the Lord, our love for Al, for our families, for games, for words, for music, and for others, and for each other. And I will tell you, as I mentioned last night to some, she was as competitive as competitive could be but just enjoyed every moment, whether she won or lost, as did I. So we were a great partnership on trying to outdo each other on those word games and activities. While we both lived on Long Island, we saw each other at least weekly. When I moved to Pennsylvania in 2002 to take a new job in education, I was an elementary teacher and then an administrator. I knew it would be very hard to not live near them any longer. 
but we promised ourselves that our bond of friendship and love would not be broken by distance, and it truly never was. Holly and I, and most times Al, wisecracking in the background, spoke every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Those calls were sacred to us, and they were never less than at least an hour long. We would also speak at other times during the week if we wanted or felt the need to do so. I miss those wonderfully supportive, funny, encouraging, godly phone calls. Holly and Al were giving people. They gave of themselves in so many ways to encourage and to help others. They loved to entertain and to make sure that good music and good food were always a part of that entertainment. They never did things in a small way, but they did things quietly to not bring undue attention to themselves, but to give all honor and glory to the Lord. Mm. I was so blessed to have them in my life and see the godly example that they were for the Lord. They always were there for my family and me through thick and thin, through the good, the bad, the horrific. As I pray, I was for them. The three of us were truly best friends. Someone once told Holly and I after the homegoing, homegoing of both of our moms that if our moms ever had the opportunity to return to this earth, they would never, ever want to, despite how much we miss them. Right. I am sure that our moms and dads and Holly and Al are enjoying that place in heaven that God prepared for them. I'm also sure that it is their desire that we join them in heaven when our time here on earth is done, mm -hmm. because we know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, right. just as they did. Right. In the first chapter of Colossians, it says, that God had delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Amen. We as believers have a home with the Lord. Yes. I know without a question the sister of my heart and my bestest forever friends, Holly and Al, have been conveyed into that kingdom. They are home. Evelyn's known them since she was six years old. Since she was six years old. And there's a lot of people in this church that love them greatly as well. I want to express something to you just real briefly. And that is that the video system, the computer system is working just fine. But uh, because of all the things that we wanted to do with the pictures and the video, because there's two different sets, it may take a little bit of time to get hymns up and things like that. That's sort of what the delay was at the beginning. I'm going to talk until you can get that video up. When you do, just do it. All right? Good. One, two, three.
just take it away, buddy, all right? <laughs> Put that together, and now I'm getting all choked up. So, I love bluegrass, obviously, um, and uh, when he found out that, that I had a banjo, he's like, you need to come on over here, and uh, Emmanuel and I would go over to his house, and we would, we would play songs just like that, and uh, we played that song in church, we played some other songs in church, and, uh, you know, the funny thing I realized was... I never actually heard him play the banjo because we would go over there and he would always grab the harmonica and he'd hand the banjo to me. And uh, <laughs> so this, this is Al's banjo. They tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm cloud dries. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Well, the way this is going to work is Brother Keith is going to guide us through this time of sharing and congregation. And Brother Keith, I'm going to hold your water for you, all right? So I'll hand around the mic, and you stand up here and direct the whole thing. Julius, I need you to go back and get that bottle of sanitizer, and we'll just sanitize this mic between people. Okay, Keith? <sighs> What a blessing. What a blessing Al and Holly were. Uh, you know, they came here about 10 years ago. We were, we were here. Um, I was leading the hymns, First Baptist Church. We were in the, the other building. And Holly, uh, Holly wanted to play the organ, and she brought her own organ. 
And uh, so her and I had a, a relationship that built around the music. And um, Al and Holly watched my kids grow up and watched my kids grow to love the Lord and serve the Lord. Um, and, you know, there was, a, there was a period of time where we stopped coming to this church and we were going over to a First Baptist Church in Georgetown. And probably once every two or three months, Al would just appear. And we would like, come on, come on. And, and what a great day uh, when Al would come. He'd sit with us and we'd go find the kids and we'd make sure <laughs> that uh, uh, Al saw them. And uh, um, I knew that he loved the Three Stooges. And he and Emmanuel would... <laughs> They would banter back and forth, you know, they would do the eye poke in the block and, you know, Al would hit, do his uh, curly impressions, woo, 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 you know, and he did everything but dance and, you know, spin around on the floor. But uh, uh, one day I had heard about the Stoogeum, which is the official Three Stooges Museum, and it's up near Philadelphia, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania area, and... Uh, and everybody's like, well, why in the world would the Three Stooges Museum be in Philadelphia? I thought they were out in Hollywood. Well, um, Larry uh, was actually from Philadelphia, and it was his son-in-law who started it. So anyway, we, uh, Emmanuel and I, we took Al to the Three Stooges Museum, and you thought he was in heaven. I mean, we had, we had such a good time, and I... I didn't have any pictures because you, you weren't allowed to take pictures in there, but uh, man, he just loved it. He just loved it, loved it, loved it. And uh, we learned a lot about, uh, you know, the Three Stooges. Like, I never knew that uh, Curly's first name was actually Jerome. So there's a, there's a, a thing that I learned from Al. Um, and we were just amazed that they, they, they pursued after us, you know, like I said, we're Georgetown, they would pursue after us, and uh, always on their way to Fenwick Island, they would stop and uh, have church services with us, and, um, and then we, we you know, obviously came back here, and uh, just so many stories. Um, we got a call from Al one day, and he goes, you uh, got a barbecue grill? And I'm like, no, I don't have a, we, we used to, but we don't have one. He goes, I got a barbecue grill for you. So little did I know that it would take three or four people to actually pick this up and lift it and move it. Uh, but, you know, all the hail boys went over there and we, we muscled it in my truck. And, uh, and I'm looking at this thing and, you know, uh, it's like a Cadillac. I mean, it really is. <laughs> and I had seen some things in this barbecue grill I've never, ever seen before in my life. You know, I'm used to lava rocks. You know, you get a bag of lava. No, he had these like pyramid, little pyramid, ceramic pyramids. I'm like, what are those? He goes, trust me. So, uh, and then he had to make sure that I had, uh, I was not allowed to grill on the grill. I had to have this copper mat on there and you, and you know, but I learned and he probably <laughs> talked to me like every week. Did you grill yet? Did you grill yet? Did you grill yet? And, and Tracy's like, we better, we better grill, and you better tell Al. So every time I grilled, I would tell Al, and he was just so happy that uh, I was grilling on his grill. Um, and, uh, oh, my goodness. You could just hear him with that New York accent. Oh, yeah. Well, and then, and it never, fa never failed. Every time I was in his presence, he went into his curly routine every <laughs> single time. So, you know, <laughs> that was just every single time. Um, and like I said, he and, he and Emmanuel had a real close bond around the Three Stooges. That was a good thing. Um, when Al died, um, Holly called us and she said, there's nobody in the whole world who would rather have that banjo that he'd want to give that banjo to than you. And uh, I like, Holly, I can't take that. And she insisted. There was no arguing, no arguing with, with Holly. Yeah. And, uh, no, that's true. Oh my goodness! Uh, when when uh, Al passed away, we wanted to really look after Holly. Uh, 
we were really concerned about her, Tracy and I, and um, they were very, very private people at times, and they were giving, 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 giving. They loved to give, but they would never receive. Mm. If you tried to give to them, they would turn around and give it back in some way. But, you know, always we would say, you know, can we come over? Can we do stuff for you? And it was at that point when Al died that she opened up the door and she allowed Tracy and I to minister mm -hmm. under her Amen. and to serve her yeah. and to give to her. And I, I told her, I said, Holly, we are so blessed and so honored that you would allow us to help you. Right. Because that was just totally out of her character. And uh, I, would, uh, I would check up on her once a week. Um, and then it, it got closer and closer, uh, more, more than that, a couple times a week. And, you know, the last picture in that video was my family going over and visiting with Holly. And she would sit in the chair with her feet up. And we would, we would just minister to her mm -hmm. and uh, make sure she was eating um, and, and these other things. And she, she had... Uh, things that she liked to eat, like uh, Twizzlers. She loved Twizzlers. Oh my goodness, there were Twizzlers everywhere. Uh, um, and uh, <laughs> one of the last times we were there, we were trying to get her to eat, and Tracy opened up the refrigerator, and there was a pie in there. And the pie, it, it looked like somebody had mauled into the top of the pie, you know, just <laughs> And Tracy goes, you want a pie? And she goes, that's all done. She goes, I only eat the top off of it. <laughs> She goes, you can throw that away. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, we were going over, this was a Sunday. It was a little bit before Christmas. We were going over there. We, we started going over Sunday. Sundays were, Sunday afternoons were the day we would always make it our, our time to go over there. And... Uh, you know, we went over there to visit her, and we were, we got a phone call from Susan, as we're on the way to Holly, uh, Holly's that, that Holly, is in the emergency room, and so we went by the house, and we were met by her neighbor, and you know, he told us she's in the emergency room. We went right to the emergency room. Um, they would not allow us both to go in, but they allowed one us us to go in one at a time. Mm. Um, and I spent a couple hours with Holly, praying, singing to her, um, you know, stroking her face and her eyebrows, holding her hands. Um, her feet were uncovered, and they were cold, so I was trying to hold her feet and warm up her feet. And, uh, oh, my goodness. Mm. And... Uh, after, after, and Tracy was very gracious in the car. So I, was, I was spending so much time with Holly, and then we swapped, and I went in the car, and, and Tracy got to spend that special time with Holly. And then the next day, she went into hospice, and we were there. And uh, we talked. We was like, we just want to be there. We want to help usher her into eternity and um, Tracy's you know Tracy's not a person who will like to talk a lot but Holly would say I just want to go home and Tracy would be like Holly we're that's what we're here we're trying to get you home we're trying to get you home Holly I just want to be with Al and uh, those that last week are going to just be, the, that's a treasure. That's a treasure. That's a treasure. Amen. And you know, you know, I, I, I have to believe that in a way that's, you know, one of those treasures that we lay up in heaven to be able to share that time, that blessed hope. 
The yeah. whole reason that we're here is because each and every one of us share a blessed hope that there's something else beyond here and now. Amen. Our lives here are but a vapor. Right. That's what the Bible says. It's but a vapor. Right. You know, we're here for a reason. We're created for God's glory. We're here to learn how to love him and how yeah. to serve him and how to love each other. And uh, we love Alan Holly. So if, uh, if anybody else would, would like to share an experience, I know they have touched everybody in a special way. And so if, if you would like to share a story, I just want to encourage you. Pastor's got the mic. Uh, please, please don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go ahead, Robin. is the way that they loved and the way they shared. And Alan Holly knew that I loved singing. And they were so supportive. I remember when I was, the first song I sang was Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And when I got finished, I was so nervous. And I guess Holly sensed it. And I told her <laughs> that I was really nervous. And she looked at me and she said, don't be. She said, you're among friends and family. And I remember that to this day. And I that remember that was one thing that I really remember about them is their love and the way they, they shared. Does anybody else like to? All right, Oscar. Take it. Okay. Uh, Everybody <laughs> says they don't need it, but when, when you know, people are on Facebook, it's just... Well, when they first come to our church, uh, they got there late because they missed the turn and they went out to Atlanta, wherever they went, and they got back, and I was at the back door, and I met with them, and we got to be pretty good friends, and it got Christmas time, and we had a nativity scene, which was up on the counter, up on that table there, and she said, I came in, and she said, I set them up but I have no idea who's Joseph. So I just picked one up, and I said, Joseph, and set it back down. She grabbed it, and she looked at it and said, there's nothing on there. <laughs> but she had a great sense of humor. So it, every time Christmas come around, an nativity scene, she'd, I'd walk by, and she'd say, Joseph, and set it back down. So, uh, and then, then when I would come, come in, and she'd speak to my wife, and she said, oh, it's you. you know, but she had a great sense of humor. We, we kidded back and forth like that, but we really loved them. They were good people. <laughs> Anybody else? I only knew Holly about uh, three years, but uh, I enjoy her organ playing, and uh, sometimes when I would sing, I would have Pat and Holly to play for me because I liked the organ with the piano. But she loved the Lord, I know that. I could see that in her eyes. Her demeanor and uh, the way she carried herself. She loved the Lord. And anybody that loves the Lord I'm going to tag along because I love the Lord too. Amen. And I know she's singing probably in the heavenly choir. <laughs> if Jesus has one up there, she's singing with the angels. Yes. And Al is playing his banjo up there. Yeah. I love them. And Holly's crazy about it. She just loves it. <laughs> and I love them. They were sweet people. And they, you know, I, all I can say is that they're good witnesses. Yeah. If I could tag along, I'm going to be up there someday. <laughs> I know that. 
for sure. Very good. Pastor. Very good. I saw your hand, Charlene. I'll get you right now, honey, okay? Well, yeah, you do, because media, social media needs to hear you. Facebook needs to hear you, okay? Yeah. I just praise the Lord for what um, Brother Al and Miss Holly meant to me. I know for the last few years, he would make a visit. I would see him at least once a month. He did a lot for me. They did a lot for me personally. Um, she would always make sure I had beautiful sweaters. But I think the most amazing thing that um, I remember about her, she had a, a real love for Andrea. Amen. She did. She got to hear Andrea play the piano. Andrea has a few learning disabilities, but to hear her play that piano, you would never know it. Miss Holly helped me out many times with a little bit of money for her lessons, and I would say, oh, Miss Holly, I don't need that. I can take care of that. She'd say, no, take it. So I thank God for that, and I thank God for the love that she, that she showed me during my time of, I had a bout with cancer, too, in 2013. Hmm. Every Thursday night, her and Brother Al would bring us meals because for about the first nine months of my cancer, I was, I would then, I had no appetite. Hmm. I couldn't taste anything. Um, it was kind of a rough time, but, uh, you know, I never shed any tears over it because I knew God had it all planned before I was born that this was going to happen. And it just made me a stronger Christian. And they would um, come in with all of this food. They bought enough probably for two or three weeks. <laughs> But uh, at that time, I had no appetite. I couldn't eat it. I couldn't smell it. She brought a lot of plastic silverware because I just couldn't use the regular silverware. So I thank God for her love that she showed for me and for my husband. Every Mother's Day, every Father's Day, she would send us a beautiful card. And I never forgot that. And I have all of those cards because it meant so much to me. But uh, I would say the most uh, wonderful thing that I do remember about her is her love for Andrea and, um, and her help to, to kind of finance Andrea's piano lessons. I had no problem financing them, but she wanted to be a blessing. And I just praise the Lord that she did get to hear Andrea play a couple of times. And uh, Andrea is doing her well, and I, I, I just love them dearly. I miss those visits. I miss her beautiful smile. I miss her at the organ. I just miss everything about him. Okay, yes. Uh, I know all of you don't know me. I have just been a friend of Holly's. Uh, a short time compared to a lot of people. And where we met was actually at Nanakoke Hospital while Al was waiting for his scans and my husband who had cancer also, and he was kind of in the middle of it, was waiting for our scans. And of course, Holly and I struck up a conversation and became best friends from then on. <laughs> and uh, I don't so even weird. know how it came up, but we both love music. I love to sing. It's what I do. It has gotten me through my husband. I mean, without my music, I don't know where I'd be. But Holly played the piano for me. I would lead the Christmas caroling at Heritage Shores every Christmas, and it was me and Holly. It was the Holly Mard Show, and we just had the best time, and she always was so loving and sharing, and and she gave me so much just, just being with her. But we didn't have a real good personal relationship but just that relationship and she knew how much I love music I knew how much it was a part of her life and I thank God that I got to meet her and when she died it it, it really meant a lot to me and, and when you say about what a special time it was when you were with her my husband also went into hospice and we have five children and he went into hospice and my kids came and never left our house they all worked and everything but they came they set up their offices in my dining room, and they'd have conference calls and whatever, but they would not leave their daddy's side. 
And they've said also that that was the most awful time of their lives, but the most wonderful, sharing, loving time. And I, I feel that for Holly, too. She just gave me that, that love. And I thank God that I was in her life even for that short time. Well, I know that Earl and uh, Susan want to do a poem, and I, I want to get to that. But before we do, if there's one or two others, Dad? I don't know if Holly can hear or see or know what's going on, but I know I one thing. Sometimes. The, yeah. She knows that the last thing that I am is an organist. <laughs> and bless her heart, she encouraged me so much to get on that instrument. But I want you to know, Holly, if you are listening, even if I take my shoe off, I still can't get my foot on the right pedal. <laughs> yeah, she did pretty good with that organ, I'll tell you. Well, Earl, Sue, why don't you give your poem, if you will? Is there somebody else? Come on up to the pulpit. Yes, go ahead, Toy. Hold on just a second. I'm not real sure if I've met her, <laughs> but I think I did one time she was here. Did she have oxygen? Like I had to pray with her, I believe. I think Cindy was telling me that she used to play the organ here. Yes. But I just wanted to tell the church in her honor that it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing to be in the presence of those that serve the Lord. Yeah. So we have so much of a celebration. Yeah because they went where they were headed to go. Yeah. And that's the beauty in it. Yeah. We might miss them, but we know that that's where we're trying to go. So I thank God that what I'm getting from all this is just not to hold on to this life so nearly and dearly, but to know that we got to get our folks to heaven Yeah, all that we yeah. can. And I thank you. I remember at Pensacola Christian College, thousands of people worshiping together. At Riverdale, thousands of people. Solid rock, at least a thousand, I would think, up there when we were there. I can't wait till heaven. Imagine what it will be like. The millions, I believe millions, that will be worshiping Christ at that time. Well, this is a good day in many ways. Yeah, it is. We know that Al and Holly are with the Lord. I have no doubt of that. From, from actually from Evelyn about Holly and Al, it just confirms that, you know, they're in heaven. And um, I, just, um, I just want this to be honoring to them and that they'll see this, be able to see this. And even if they don't, yeah, I don't know what the Lord has for us. I know he's had wonderful things, but they'll know. Whether they see it or not, they'll know. I believe that. Um, it's a poem here, and before I say it, it's not what I would call it truly. It is a Christian poem in some ways, but I just want to look at it, everybody to think of it as um, what it, what, I, what this one verse is not part of the poem. It's another poem, actually. But, and everybody knows it usually. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. And I think if you look at the poem or listen to the poem in that respect, I think you'll understand why, you know, I'm thinking of Holly and Al. I did take the liberty of changing a few things. Um, not much, very little. A friend, I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and then spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For that dash represents all the time they spent on earth and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. 
So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can be still rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel, to be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this little special dash might mm, only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would Christ be honored by how you lived your dash? Uh, most of you that know me know that I don't like to get up and talk, but Al and Holly were a very special couple. Uh, I have, we have happy memories, all good memories, happy and funny. And I guess I rem they both had a great sense of humor, but I guess I remember Holly's more because the remarks that she used to make to me. Uh, I used to take Al to ball games. We went to Oriole games to usually about two a year with a group of four people from church. Uh, Pastor Hopkins, Dennis, Jason, Danny Griffith. Uh, but uh, Al was a Yankees fan. I did not like the Yankees, never did, never, still don't. But Al was very gracious about it. He, uh, he went and rooted for the Orioles unless they were playing the Yankees. And we had a lot of back and forth about the Orioles and the Yankees. And the Yankees usually beat, usually beat us, of course. But I would pick up Al for the ball game, and <clears throat> Holly would come out, and I'd say, uh, now, Holly, it's going to be about 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's going to be late. And she'd lean in the window and she'd say, could you keep him all night? And then she would laugh. And so we went to the game. And uh, on the way home, I would like to stop and get coffee since I was driving. <coughs> and the other guys would get sodas or something. Well, this one night about six years ago, we stopped at the 7-Eleven. And we discovered they had slushy, icy drinks fruit slushy and Al fell in love with a watermelon slushy and from that point on that became the highlight of the trip to Baltimore as we were going up to the game we passed the 7-eleven I would say Earl are we gonna get a slushy on the way home I said yes Al we'll get a slushy on the way home so we got we'd get back home and Al would put the garage door up and Holly would be uh, open the inner door to the house there and she'd be waiting up for him so we also went to uh, gospel concerts, bluegrass, uh, usually one or two a year. We went up to Wilmington one night, just him and I, and, and uh, I'd stop by and pick up Al, and I'd say, Holly, you sure you don't want to go? She said, no, I don't like bluegrass, uh, crabgrass. And she always said the same thing. I knew what she was going to say. That's why I asked her. She said, I don't like crabgrass. But we'd enjoy that, and Al would have a good time. And... Uh, the past few years, I started giving out musical birthday cards for his birthday. His birthday was December 21st, and I think the first year I gave him a Superman theme. It's, it played the theme to Superman. Another year it was Rocky, and the year after that was Louis Armstrong singing What a Wonderful World. And last year, or not this past year, 2020, I gave him a card with the Indiana Jones theme. And so I called talked to Holly that night or the night after. I said, did Al like his card? She said, yes, he loved it, but could you do me a favor? She said, you know, he's 85 now. Could you give him something a little calmer next year? She said, he's, he's running around the house playing his card. He thinks he's Indiana Jones. She said, I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid he's going to find the whip and hurt somebody. <laughs> so that was Holly's sense of humor, and I'll, I'll never forget that. But uh, I'm wearing Al's work coat today. Uh, I'm honored to wear it. Uh, Holly wanted me to have it, and we were over there one, I guess one day in August, and Holly said, you need some T-shirts. I said, yeah, I could use some T-shirts. So Holly never did anything in a small way, of course, even at the end. So she said, come on in the bedroom. She started pulling the shirts out of the drawer, laid them out on the bed, and she said, I said, well, I'll pick out two or three. She said, no, they're all yours. Take them. And I got home. There were 42 of them. <laughs> So I shared them with JR and Travis and a couple other guys, and we've been enjoying wearing them. But uh, we have a lot of good memories and uh, a lot of funny memories, and we miss them every day. But uh, 
somebody said the other day, I think the best way to sum up Alan Holly's life, if I could, would be to know them was to love them. I think that really uh, sums it up. And uh, But we miss him every day. We love you, Alan Holly, and, but we're thankful that you're up in heaven, <laughs> rejoicing with the Lord. And <coughs> and we know that we'll see you someday, uh, maybe soon. So this is uh, one of Al's favorite hymns, um, and I'm not going to play it in the style of Holly. I'm going to, you know, or the hymn book style. I'm going to play it in the Al style, the crabgrass style. So. I'm kind of homesick for a country. Which I've never been before. No sad goodbye shall there be spoken, and time won't matter anymore. In view of land. message isn't going to be like what you get on Sunday morning or Sunday night. I want you just to first and foremost know that Keith Hale wrote it, all right? I'll let you know that ahead of time, so if it really stinks, you'll know it was all Keith's fault. Matthew chapter 7, to start with, before I get into what I believe are some great remarks that Keith did put together, and this is something I believe Al would want. 
Al loved the scriptures. He enjoyed the Old Testament scriptures. And what I find here is that Keith knew him really well. And so he put together a message that would be exactly what Al would want to hear preached. But let me start with Matthew chapter 7. I've always been fascinated, my friends, with how easy it is for us not to get salvation. I mean, I've been shocked by it, actually. I think many Christians are, and we're somewhat dismayed by it. Because what happens is the world loves religion. They just love it. But they hate the truth. And can I tell you, they have nothing the one to do with the other. You say, well now, pastor, James does tell us that pure religion and undefiled is to visit the fatherless and the widowed and to keep thyself unspotted from the world. Don't you know that's in the Bible? That is one verse in the entire New Testament focused on religion in a sense, but not in the actual conglomeration of what we know to be religion today. The actual conglomeration of what we know to be religion today has nothing to do with the truth. What religion teaches us is this. You do these certain things, all right? And you just get it to a point where you're doing real good at that. And then God will receive you based on all those good things you've done. And you'll go to nirvana, eternal peace, Abraham's bosom, heaven, whatever you want to call it. That's religion. And it's lied to. It's a lie that's repeated 7,018 times. That's how many religions there are. You say, well, pastor, why are there so many splinters? It's because no one, no one wants to just submit to the truth. You understand this? What do they want instead? Well, they want desperately to find something they can do that they can get to heaven and say, God, look, I did this. It doesn't matter that I'm sleeping with someone outside of marriage. It doesn't matter that I cuss up a storm. It doesn't matter that I've ruined my body with narcotics. It doesn't matter any number of sin. Yeah, you just don't care about sin at all. You just want me to be good. And that's exactly why 90% of people end up in hell. They are certain they're going because of good works. Because of something they've done that covered up all that evil. My friends, we're evil, period. You can't cover it up. It's filthiness. And Matthew chapter 7, down to verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, Lord, Lord. You see, what you see here is, He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out, have cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works? If you would go over to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, you'll see this. The Bible says, Jesus speaking. In verse 25 of John 11. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, it's not good works. It's not what you are, what you think you can do. It's not building yourself up to a point where I've been exercising spiritually. Somehow I'm going to get to heaven. No, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That's an interesting question. Believest thou this? You know, Jesus throughout the Old Testament and then into the New, over and over again, made it clear that righteousness is by faith. Righteousness is by faith. Righteousness is by faith. What religious system did Abraham follow to get to heaven? None. He believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The question is, do we not get that? Well, why don't we get it? 
2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us why. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us why. If you'll go over there, you'll see this. In whom the God of this world. You see that little G? In Greek, you'll see this means Satan. Okay? It means Satan. It means his spirit. In whom the God of this world, because otherwise it'd be large G. You understand? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Why don't we get the light? Why don't our eyes open? Why don't we realize it's all in Christ? Well, once we get that, then there are other barriers. Because a lot of people will say, well, then I do. I believe in Jesus. I only believe in Jesus. He's the only one that can get me to heaven. I get that, Pastor. He's the only one. I've got it now. And then they'll never repent. They just keep living in sin. And they have no conviction at all. No blood guiltiness at all. No concern at all. And you say, no, no, you still don't have it. How many of you one day gave your heart to Christ and repented of your sin? All right. Those of you who just raised your hand, do you remember that day? Do you remember that day? Somebody tell me, is it an incredible experience to truly be saved? Isn't it amazing? Now, you know what I get? Sometimes when I'm talking to folks, I do believe in Jesus, and I did pray the prayer, and I did all these things. And then I say, did you remember that day? And they say, yeah. And I think they were never saved. They were never saved. Because when somebody asks me about the day I'm saved, anybody in this room that really got saved is going to go, oh, yeah, I remember that day. What a difference God makes. What an incredible thing. Now, if you go to Abraham and you think about the illustration of this man, Matthew 22 in verses 31 and 32, but touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that what was spoken unto you by God, Exodus 3 and verse 6, tells us what was spoken unto him by God, saying, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You know, our God is the God of Al, and the God of Holly, and the God of everyone you've ever seen pass through. And you knew, but you knew, and they'll tell you, and they profess. Whoa, I was saved. I remember the day I was saved. God moved in a special way. You know, Brad McMilliams is just about the least emotional person I've ever met when it comes to the things of the church. You won't see him back there raising his hands or clapping or flopping his, you know, none of that. But you sit down with Brother Brad in his living room and ask him about the day he was saved. And I'll tell you, you're going to find a hallelujah moment like you never saw. This man starts to weep and cry and praise the Lord and glorify him. And that's how it is with any one of you. You say, well, I'm not real emotional. Oh, I start talking to you about the Lord and how your day was saved, salvation. Woo, that'll change you, won't it? Mark 26 and 27, as touching the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, this is Exodus, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You do greatly err. Now, these are the Pharisees. These are Sadducees. The Sadducees, I believe, are the ones that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. I tell you, the very hallmark of our understanding of being saved is that I die to myself and I'm resurrected to new life. And you know what that does? It leaves my sin in that figurative grave. Individuals that have no change whatsoever and say, Yeah, I went through that prayer sing songingly. Dear Lord, please forgive me for my sin. I believe you died on the cross and I just want to be right with you. Why don't you change my life? They're no more saved than a dog. And if you're one that did that, you're headed to hell today. And if you get hit by a car after this service, you're gone. 
forever in a burning, literal hell. Say, Pastor, is this what Alan Holly would want? Oh, yes. I have no doubt that this is what they'd want people to hear. Genesis 25 and 7. Then Abraham gave up the ghost, spirit. He died a good old age, an old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. Interestingly enough, Abraham, who the father of righteousness was, listen now. Abraham, who the father of righteousness truly was, was that because of his determination to have faith in what God said and come out of the land of Ur and do exactly what the Lord said. He obeyed, obeyed, obeyed. Who are Abraham's people? Now, this says here that he was gathered to his people. And this, right in front of all the people around Jesus that didn't even believe in the resurrection. He's saying, what are you talking about? This doesn't say something about a past man that doesn't exist anymore. This right here tells us of the patriarchs that are still alive. You say, well, where in the world are they? Sarah, his wife. Haran, his brother. Terah, his father. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. And then what? Obedience. Where are Abraham's people? In paradise. Abraham's bosom is one thing that was mentioned throughout the Gospels. Interestingly enough, Elijah went to this place. Interesting, isn't it? How God has blessed and given us wisdom on all accounts. You see the story of the rich man and Lazarus, right? Where did he go? Where did Lazarus go? Abraham's bosom. And the schism between heaven and Abraham's bosom. Can I tell you something? Just like in that day, that rich man crying out and saying, Give me just a drop of water! Oh God, give me just a drop of water! And don't you think for just a second that the King James vernacular gives it exactly the way he said it. First of all, he wasn't speaking English. And second of all, he didn't just say, Perhaps you could come and give me just a tip. On the tip of your finger, it's a drop of water. He's screaming, my friends. I got news for you. He was in what the Bible says, torment. Help us to get this, Lord. Help us to get it that people need to hear the truth. They don't need to hear a sweet eloquence. The heart of the earth in Matthew 12, 40 speaks. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly... So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 6 explain to us what baptism is a picture of. And this certainly is the understanding that we die, we're buried, and we're resurrected with Christ. According to Romans 10 and verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's not religion. You don't see anything about sacraments or ordinances or any of that. You know, it's not the Catholics and the Pentecostals and the Mormons that are the worst. Sometimes it's the Baptists. I, don't, I can't tell you how many Baptists believe you must be baptized to go to heaven. I got news for you. That's a bunch of garbage. There's no physical water that will ever cleanse spiritual sin. Ever. The blood of Jesus Christ alone cleanses sin. 1 John 1 and verse 7 tells us this. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of God's Son, the blood of Christ's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's only the blood. Why are they there in hell? They're waiting, or in heaven. They're waiting for the promised Messiah, the rescuer, the Christ, the blood sacrifice of animals, could not sufficiently atone for it. Understanding this, that one day, all those places that sometimes we get confused in our minds are going to converge in what we know to be heaven. John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Abraham's bosom is a Jewish idiom for paradise, garden, orchard, forest, park. These are Keith's thoughts. I want to make sure you know. Abraham's side, next to Abraham with Abraham, a place of rest, contentment, peace. Abraham's a protector or patron. You're looking at Luke 16 now, in verses 19 through 31, and it gives you that story of the rich man and Lazarus. 
And there's nothing more vivid than to hear him crying out. Looking up to Abraham. Won't you just send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue? Send him to my brothers. Won't you send him to my brothers? Won't you do something, oh God, do something? And the Lord said, hey, listen, they've got the prophets. They've got that crazy pastor buried. If they don't listen to him, they won't listen to an angel if he was standing in front of them. I have people all the time say, why doesn't God just come and show himself to me? Because of that attitude. He never will because of that very attitude. That very attitude will send people right to a flaming, burning hell. That rebellious attitude is called witchcraft because no one recognizes it like they should. It is vile. It is wicked. It's worse than the worst murder to have that kind of rebellious attitude towards the holy God. They say, now, Pastor, why do you have to be so blunt? Can you take a second and just think of what it must be like to hear thousands of people, millions, yea, billions, in that place crying out and saying take me away from here oh god please take me away from here and it's too late right now it's not what am i supposed to do i'm not going to give you a joel osteen speech i'm going to tell you what jesus would say which is wholly different Christ was frank with people, up front with people, told them the truth, explained that hell was real. 33%, one-third of his whole ministry was hell, 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 hell. Certainly there's more than hell to talk about. Heaven is a marvelous place. Full of glory and grace, I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful, heaven is a marvelous, heaven is a wonderful place. Now Jesus and the thief on that cross give us another picture. Luke 23 and verse 42 through 43, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, the day they, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. For those of you who believe you need to be baptized, consider this man who never was baptized, who simply said, I want to be with you. And he said, You will be, period. Salvation isn't some big, long, drawn-out prayer. Salvation is a decision of the heart. I'm not the one. I can't. There's no good thing I could do. Oh, God, save me. That's salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3 and verses 18 through 22 show us of Jesus descending and preaching to these souls in the heart of the earth. Ephesians 4, 9, Christ descended into the lower parts of of the earth, Sheol in Hebrew, the place of the dead, a temporary place where souls are kept as they wait final resurrection. Hades, or this is the Greek word, the place of the dead, Enon, Hebrew, hell, Gehenna, Greek, hell, descended below in what? The lake of fire, a lake that burns forever in which we are. And understand this, my friends, we are concerned for the lost who are here in this incredible place. I mean, the Lord's given us an incredible earth. But that lake of fire, understand this, my friend. According to what we see from scientists, they have discovered a kind of fire that up around 10,000, or, or is it 1,000? Maybe, I think it's, I'm sorry, I'm not a scientist, but I do remember this very important fact. I actually saw the video. As heat increased, to a point where the yellow and the blue and all of that went away and it was just black. The hottest fire you can get is a black fire that has no, no light. The Bible says that hell is a place where there is no light, period. The hot fire is so hot that it just burns black. It doesn't burn out ever, but it burns black. 
this lake of fire, the final hell, a place of eternal punishment for all unrepentant rebels, both angelic and human, a place of burning sulfur, eternal unspeakable agony of an unrelenting nature. People say, this earth is horrible. And then they illogically turn around and say, why would God ever keep people out of heaven? You just said this place is horrible. What makes it horrible? You. Won't it be great when there's none who are rebelling against God and all are submissive and broken hearted and yearn for Him? That's a wonderful place. But this earth where 90, 95% of the inhabitants hate Him and think He's an idiot and hey, let's just use His rainbow for the LGBTQ perversity and everything else that goes along with it. The attitudes, the, my friends, that rebellion, no matter how much I talk about it, for some, they're just going to say, oh, that's stupid. Oh, that dumb preacher. Oh, well, it's not me. Your Lord hates that perverted stuff. Romans 1 tells us so. Women with win, women, men with men, it's sin against their own bodies. He calls it taking a hot iron and searing your conscience in that way. It's just one illustration of hundreds of ways humans are perverted. Isaiah tells us so. One time Ken told me, he said, Brother, you preach so much on the perversion of men. Maybe sometimes you should tell people the opposite side of that. You remember this, Ken? And I agree with you. So let me just do that for one second and I'll be done. Jesus Christ alone changes the soul. And all that has to happen is you say, Lord God, heaven of heaven, I know I'm not right. Will you change me? Will you move? And then step out of the way and let him do it. Now, how is that possible? Only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Physical death and spiritual death in Luke 12, 4 and 5 is given I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. You say, but my God, the God I serve, he's a good God. He wouldn't want me to fear him, my friends. I can understand the importance of looking at God in that way. I really do. But I also understand that just like an 18-wheeler, I can stand in front of that 18-wheeler and get plowed over by it, or I can be transported by it. I fear it either way. Which are you going to do? Get into Christ and let Him move you? Or be put in the only place that you can go apart from heaven. 